Cody, this dude has been there from the beginning of an organization that has done one billion in annuity sales in one month. Yeah, back in April. That's insane. I like a lot of people that I'm sure are listening and maybe you guys, I don't know. I started off as a glorified telemarketer out of college, right? So hopped into a cubicle, got paid 28 grand a year was asked to dial 100 or 150 times a day manually. But those early days, like a lot of us, it was a lot of hustle, a lot of phone calls, trying to feel your way in the space of what the what the 8% do differently and then what the 8% need, right, to be a successful long-term. A lot more to build in a business than where that next lead's coming from. I've been surrounded by a lot of people that have always thought extremely short-term, you know, or, or were just trained that way by a lot of the companies out there. And I feel like our industry shift into Maybe a little more of a long-term consultative approach. And really it's for that type of individual that doesn't want to just have to sell the same policy every day forever. You are listening to the 8% Nation podcast created to help you become a top producer in the insurance industry. Enjoy the show. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the 8% Nation podcast. Cody, we're here again. This time we have Matt Newman. He is a baller, 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 baller in the annuity <laughs> space. I have heard so many things about you. I'm so excited yeah. to unpack your story and get to know you. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Matt. Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate you having me. Thanks, Dude, bro. Uh, we, have, we have a couple mutual friends, um, but really what we'd like to do is really just kind of unpack your journey a little bit. So let me just provide a little bit of a framework. Cody, this dude has been there from the beginning of an organization that has done one billion in annuity sales in one month. Yeah, back in April. That's insane. Uh, that's with a B, not an M, a B. He's been there from the beginning. Yeah. Um, he's going to unpack that journey, that story, and I cannot wait to hear this because I don't think we've had anybody with a billion type of sales behind their name. No, and he, he mentioned something earlier. It was really neat. He, he's, he's, he said he's been doing this for, you know, he's been part of them for 15 years. And I'm like, dude, what did you start when you were 15, you know? <laughs> And it's I said the same thing with you, Cody, yeah. man. Come on, back and forth two ways. You Cody did, got started man. in this thing when he was 12, so we're yeah, all that's, good. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. Well, Matt, so we would love to just kind of you start us from the beginning, okay? I mean, go, getting to a billion annuity sales in one month has to be a wild ride of ups and downs. Why don't you just kind of unpack your story a little bit for us if you can? Sure. So the firm that I'm with is Advisors Excel, and we're out of Topeka, Kansas. Can't get any more Midwest and Heartland than where we're at, Boom. right? But uh, our firm has about 700 employees underneath our roof. Wow. And we work with 700 of the top producing independent financial advisors in the United States. So our reach is nationwide. And the people that we work with are very large asset gatherers. So not so much annuities, and we can speak to some of the annuity part here. Annuities are bread and butter to our firm. Um, but our people are, are doing a lot of direct response marketing and they're gathering assets right? They're typically selling to a plan and helping people who are retired or pre, uh, looking to retire, pre-retirees. And uh, again, with that direct response marketing, they're bringing in those clients. And then our firm in here, our 700 employees, there's a lot of different things that we do. But from a, from a product vertical standpoint, it's annuities, it's life, it's assets under management, it's a broker dealer, mm. and it's also Medicare supplements. So we've got five verticals who, that are underneath here. Um, our firm is technically a wholesaler, so we're going to make a middleman fee um, anytime those 700 advisors place clients' business into those products, whatever they might be. But um, so the financial advisor isn't paying us, guys, but uh, they are hiring us. They do need to use us. So all of our services are catering to the financial advisor. Um, a little bit about the footprint. Uh, we're completely independent, not owned by anybody, no private equity, no venture capital. We have two uh, independent founders. The guys are only 43 years old. They launched this when they were 28. So uh, wow. we've been going at it for quite a little while. And it was fun back in those early days, 2005 and six, when it was just a few of us, like I'm sure we've all experienced in the startup days with used cubicles and riding your bike to work and wearing <laughs> hoodies every day. And, you know, just kind of that whole, that whole, uh, that whole run, but it, it's fun. It's kind of grown one year at a time to the point where uh, now there's a, a lot of business that comes through here. We can talk about the annuity side, but yeah, we achieved a landmark a couple months ago uh, with those 700 advisors doing business into all those different verticals. But in that annuity one, which is a primary one inside here, just in the month of April alone, there was a little over $1 billion of uh, client premium that got submitted in the month. So 
crazy, guys. That is incredible. That's so awesome. Dude, I would love to rewind the clock, and we want to hear your personal story as much as possible. So just to cast a little bit of vision, you know, 8% Nation is Cody's brand. Everybody that's listening to this probably knows about that. Our, really, our goal is to help insurance agents succeed um, and be a part of the 8%, right? So once upon a time, you were a 23-year-old man that was trying to make your way. Um, how did you get into this space? What was the choice? Because that was back whenever, you know, this whole business wasn't that cool and sexy, you know, it was kind of like, you know, <laughs> we all walked past the insurance booths at the recruiting Like fair. a lot of people that I'm sure are listening and maybe you guys, I don't know. I started off as a glorified telemarketer out of college, right? <laughs> yeah. So hopped into a cubicle, got paid 28 grand a year, was asked to dial a hundred or 150 times a day manually, right? And uh, back then was working for a, a firm that did the same thing. We were an annuity wholesaler, but uh, in the space we can be called an IMO or an FMO, an independent marketing organization or field marketing organization, and got in making a lot of uh, dials and talking to a lot of insurance agents and starting to get a pulse like we all did first couple years out of school of what that world really feels like, what it is that the 100% out there do differently and the 92 and the eight, right? Who succeeds, why they succeed, what sort of services and value they're looking for out of partners. And uh, did that for a couple of years, worked my way up the ranks a little bit got mm -hmm. to know some people like everybody that makes it, I think in the 8% hustles, right? Puts the time in, um, yeah. continues to do what it, what needs to be done. And, uh, put me in a position, uh, just a couple of years out of school to win this firm advisors, Excel launch to be fortunate, uh, to be the first guy in the door and did the same thing, right? The same startup stories. So we got in there and hustled, continued to work with financial advisors and the difference in our firm here compared to a lot of other ones out there, Cody and Landon are, uh, we have taken an approach where we are working with, in, in your language, with that 8%. So our firm today works with the most successful ones and shows them how to pour fuel on that fire, right? Speaks into them with marketing and sales language, product, leadership, tech, organizational help. Really takes a full consultative approach to so that 8% continues to build the business with them. But those early days, back to your question, Landon, uh, like a lot of us, it was a lot of hustle, a lot of phone calls, yeah. uh, trying to feel your way in the space of what the what the eight percent do differently, and then what the eight percent need, right, to be uh, successful long term. Well, what what in your opinion is that? Uh, what do the eight percent do differently in your opinion? I mean, you're no one knows better than you, man. You've been there from the beginning. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think there's a lot of people that I would love to learn from and uh, know better than me. But um, what do they do differently? I would say. Uh, first and foremost, they they view themselves as business owners yep. as much as they do salespeople. Big. Right? And so we see a big differentiation on people that are good at sales. And, and don't get me wrong, sales has a place. And there's a lot of very successful salespeople out there. But in that world, it's still a lot of uh, one sale at a time, maybe a, a hunter versus a farmer mentality, right? Always picking one sale off at a time or the lowest hanging fruit. Um, and then on to the next one, right? And so a lot of prospectuses or pitch sheets or illustrations or brochures, as opposed to really saying, what do I want this thing to look like 36 months from now? Wow. What am I really chasing towards 60 months from now? Mm -hmm. And that it's a business owner mentality, right? Yeah. It's making sure that people see where they're going and they can build into that instead of just one sale at a time. So a little bit more of a long-term vision. We see that as, I see that as probably one of the, one of the first differentiation points. Less of a policy peddler and more of a, hey, I want to I build something special here. You know, that's yes, good. sir. That's awesome. Yes, sir. Something long term. Yep, Maybe yep. recurring revenue, having some thoughts around culture, having some thoughts around staffing and org charts. Yeah. Right. A lot more to build in the business than where that next lead's coming from. I see, I see a shift in our industry a little bit to where not only is it getting a little younger, you know, with a lot of guys like us, but, but it's, also, uh, it's also shifting to people that are, that are thinking. Like I feel like in the journey I've been in, it's been a lot of, I've been surrounded by a lot of people that have always thought extremely short term, you know, or, or were just trained that way by a lot of the companies out there. And I feel like our industry shifted into maybe a little more of a long term consultative approach where they are becoming a business owner. They are building a team They're You know, it's, it's a, just a different approach that, uh, they don't, it, 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 I mean, and really it's for that type of individual that doesn't want to just have to sell the same policy every day forever, you know, Cody. Uh, yeah, Cody, I love your perspective because at the, at the end of the day, like if we are going to rely on the companies or the carriers to train us, well, nothing against, they're great partners, yeah. right? I'm not sitting here speaking ill 
against them. But what do they want you to do? They want you to sell more policies. Yeah. yeah. Right. Every everybody has their own motives of where they're coming from. Right. So it takes uh, an individual to think a little bit bigger than that and to think uh, holistically about what they need to be building in their practice and not just in their own practice, but thinking holistically about what that client needs. Right. Do you want to be one person that sells one policy that lands in one drawer of that person in the Rolodex of 30? Right. Oh, yeah. What was that guy's name? And I'm trying to find him on my iPhone. Right. As opposed to the person that sold them their their plan, the person that takes care of them. Yeah. Right. There's a very big difference between somebody that that takes care of a retirement plan or a financial plan compared to a product or a prospectus. So. Yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Well, and, and one of the, we're you know we're fortunate enough to be able to work with Advisors Excel on some Medicare um, projects. Yeah, and you know I know you guys are rolling out a Medicare sort of arm that's relatively new. And what I'm learning in the industry um, is really the Medicare. If you can serve the Medicare client and help them, people work with the people that educate them and be that person that helps them navigate their Medicare policy. Well, you pretty much have first whack at the other stuff, the annuity business, the retirement planning, et cetera. Is that what you guys have seen too? Well, I can't, I don't want to uh, speak out of line to the Medicare division that we've launched in here because I, I know enough to be dangerous. Okay. But what yeah. I can say is uh, with a newly launched division here, we've found that plenty of the financial advisors that we were already coaching and building on the other product lines already had Medicare supplement inside of their practice. Mm. It was already a piece gotcha. of what they were doing. Gotcha. And I think it's a matter of which piece comes first because because what we're starting to find is that there are plenty of ways that you can open the door with Medicare supplements, right? Oh yeah, for sure. You guys know this as well as I do, probably better than I do. It's a tremendous door opener, yeah. right? And then at that point in time, you can sell them a policy for a few hundred bucks, or if you're good at what you do, you can then dovetail that into a bigger conversation, right? How does this then affect your total yep. uh, income, your total yep. expenses, your total liabilities? There's a lot better ways in yep. sales language to say that. Yes. But in uh, in practice, that's what it would look like. And that's what we're finding are the people that are through here are using it within their office, whether it's the, the main entrepreneur, the main advisor in the office, or maybe they have a staff of three or four or some of the big ones, 15 or 20 in that office. And somebody in there is using this as the door opener to then roll it into more holistic planning. We can help you with that one thing, but here is something that we offer all of our clients. Would you be open to taking a look at a look at that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I know we, we work, we've worked with some of your agents with before we even worked worked with advisors excel and they were telling me that they were like falling into four hundred thousand dollar annuity you know pro <laughs> projects just because they were just serving it's their just that so easy well. for anybody listening all you got to do is sign up with us you just fall into <laughs> th that's what he literally said he's <laughs> like compliance he goes, will I, I will probably have to scratch that for compliance he said uh <laughs> he said i had a million dollar goal for 2020 and i hit it in three months is what he told me wow. and he's like he's like, i didn't know what i was doing but i knew enough to to know to be dangerous and then i felt confident started bringing up the conversation and once you know like i was able to serve because it did such a good job on what they were needing right now then there was an open door for that conversation so Yes, sir. Mm, cool. There's one other thing as you say that, Landon, and it goes back to the question that you asked before as well about what the 8% do a little bit differently or might do that separate themselves out. And what I found is uh, maybe it's, I would guess it's probably the person that you're speaking to, but I find it across all the offices that I coach in here is that they are very eager to learn what other people on that 8% are doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, that's just a trait that we can talk about across success principles in any line of work that you are. I've got three young boys, right? My boys right now are 10 seven and three and in some way shape or form some of the conversations that i have with my boys are you are the people you surround yourself with right we all know that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time around we try to take that exact same principle move it into this financial field mm -hmm. where if you are gathering let's say in that in that world that you just said there landon so i want to be a million dollar producer okay we would say that if, if you're not there the quickest way to get there is to surround yourself with as many million dollar producers as possible learn with them, be shoulder to shoulder with them, yeah. network with them, and then take all that stuff that they're doing and then be smart enough as a business owner to go back into your office and decide what you want to steal, what you want to pirate, right? And take it, tweak it, make it your own. But you know, there's very few original ideas out there. We've all stolen everything from everybody else, right? So yeah. go and find the people that are where you want to be, take the stuff from them. And we've tried to really foster that community. That's, that's been one of our secret 
secrets to our success inside Advisors Excel is setting up a, a huge network mastermind collective type of environment where people learn from other successful people. And then when they're asked to pay back into the model, it's a bit of a badge of honor because they've learned throughout that system. So yeah, I exactly right to what you were saying, Landon. That, yeah, that's, I mean, that's obviously the core of our brand, right? Totally. That's what 8% that's is. Strong. That's, that's my favorite part of 8% Nation is the networking events. I mean, the speakers are fantastic and hopefully, you know, we see some people from Advisors Excel there, but really it's just getting around people. And I, no one taught me better than you. And I, we're from Springfield, Missouri, a little small town. And I had always heard that all the business books talk about that, but I saw it in action when I started hanging out with, with Cody's network. And then now we're hitting here on a podcast with dudes that are doing numbers of billions you know what I mean? And there's just something that comes along with the mindset of just hanging around that individual that just kind of, it's like, to me, it ignites the competition. It's like, it really, I'm like motivated by that. Not because I want to beat them, but because I want to like, I want people that I can sprint with, you know? Totally. And there's not a lot of people that are out there that we can get shoulder to shoulder and run, you know? So I appreciate you saying you, that. You said it well. It's not just the tactics. It's not just the resources that you're going to go steal and, and use back in your office. It's, it really is re- calculating, remanufacturing the mindset, yep. right? Of what is possible. You're sitting next to somebody at that event and maybe in a, in a joking way, but kind of not, you're thinking to yourself, that person did what? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. how is that possible? Like they've got nothing yeah. that I don't have. So all I got to do is figure out how to put a couple of these pieces of the puzzle together and I got this. So it just starts to maybe reframe your reality or what's possible out there. Mm. Yeah. You talked a lot about, um, I've, we, 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 we seem to have a lot in common without even realizing it. Cause a lot of the stuff you've already said, like mindset goals, um, thinking bigger, you know, building a business, you know, having a staff, like all the stuff you've said, like we talk a lot about, you know, um, like we have think big out in huge letters by the front door, you know, something you said a few minutes ago. Um, say there's a new agent out there, um, that is getting into some of these spaces that's that's really struggling they're like i'm on my own you know how can i really get to where i ever actually own a business versus just being a, a rep you know um what kind of mindset or, or tips or advice would you give to that individual as they're watching right now because we probably got a lot of those type of individuals you know um newer been in a few years you know but haven't been in, they're not extremely experienced yet it, my answer here for that that person will be different than five years down the road or once they've built traction. Yeah. There's got to be some sort of model out there that they can find momentum in stealing what other people who are successful have done. Right. At the, at the beginning, I'm a firm believer that it truly is without this sounding too crass or crude, but a paint by number approach. We've yeah. got to go find somebody and emulate what they're doing. Yeah. Right. That could be emulating them from a marketing standpoint. How are they getting knee to knee with people or emulating them from what's being said in that client interaction or what sort of presentation is being shown, but we have to be able to emulate it because in that stage, we don't know what we don't know. Right. There's yes. no idea for us to know if we're doing this right or if we're doing it wrong. There's no sounding board. There's no resource that I can go to. Right. I, I believe that that's I firmly believe that's the answer when you're getting to your first couple stratospheres of success, the first couple levels on the pyramid. And it may end up being absorbing what you can from one or two people within a network or a mentorship or something at one of your events um, and then moving on to another one and another one because you don't always want to stay stale with the same thing all the time. But mm -hmm. eventually, eventually down the road, that, that answer changes because you've built yes. your model. Like you can own it. This is mine. This is how I market. This is what my marketing plan looks like. This is how we present to clients in a first meeting and a second meeting and the plan that we put in front of them, right? This is how we have due diligence in the products that we recommend. And then you can steal things from other people and bring it into your model. You don't have to change who you are when you bring it in, into your model, but it's yeah. different at the beginning. At the beginning, there has to be a model that you can trust in. Right. So going and finding somebody would be, would be my suggestion in that position. Well, since you guys are only working with the top echelon um, of individuals and kind of like, it's all like a, we, you choose to work with those individuals. How would you yeah. expect, how would you recommend um, that new agent to go find that person without, cause there's a lot of snake oil, man. There's a lot of people that you shouldn't sure. be trusting. And there's a lot of people that are complete waste of time and posturing something that they are completely not. 
Instead, and I put it on Facebook. It must be true, Cody. That's I did right. a billion dollars in sales last month. You know, I put it on Facebook. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I, tr- so- I was hoping we weren't going to get on here. And you guys weren't like hopping out of Ferrari and a, you know off the private jet landing <laughs> strip or something. Yes, right? I just think, yes. You know. uh, now um, I still want the jet. I don't really care for the Ferrari. <laughs> I do still want the jet at some point. You know, but yes, but sir. but I won't jump off just to do a podcast or do a podcast on it. You know, I don't think. <laughs> But I'm sorry, uh, Landon, can you say that again? What would be, uh, what were you asking? <laughs> well, there's the, just a lot the, of, the uh, jet got me off there's of a lot of smoke and mirrors. There's a lot of like posturing going on with someone that just wants to recruit and get in, get in our, we, I'm sure you get it a lot. People want to get in our backpacks and I'm sick of that. And, I, and we want to not allow, we don't want to encourage our agents to jump in someone else's, you know, just really just kind of take advantage, like get taken advantage of for their hustle. So what's a question that you feel like they should be asking their mentor or what's a process. Here's a mindset. Yeah. 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 I I think I know where you're going with that. Landon. So I would be leery of anybody recruiting me if I'm being honest, you know, because I think there's a lot of situations that you see where um, it is more, this is probably too, too crude of language, but like it is a bit of a pyramid scheme where the, the whole organization is built more on making money off of other people versus servicing and taking care of clients, right? Um, There's a gentleman who is getting ready to join our firm to become one of our clients and he's coming out of a model like that. And it is definitely uh, needing to shift his mindset on what success looks like, on what you can control. So to go back, I would would just be a bit leery um, anytime somebody is recruiting me if I can take the offensive though, if I can see somebody else that I would like to emulate and I can find a way to work for free or I can find a way to partner up with them um, in a way that's non-intrusive to them, mm-hmm. right? And we can typically tell by how the people are structured and what sort of organization they're with if we dig in just a little bit, yeah. you know, what sort of value they can bring. Now I'm biased. I'm biased here because I work with independent advisors. I work with entrepreneurs. So that's not to say that there are not, there are plenty of incredible people out there with the Merrills and the Morgans and the Northwesterns of the world. Sure. Right. But those aren't the people that we work with. The people that we work with are the independents. So if I see an independent that has hung their shingle, that is successful, it might have a couple people on staff that I can see out there marketing, whether it's digitally or over the radio or TV or whatever it is, I would then step into taking the offensive approach of going and, and trying to position myself next to them and finding if there's a way that I can learn from them. Hmm. So it might just be more about the tactic of how I would approach it instead of sitting back and hearing somebody else's sales pitch about why I need to be working with them. Yeah. Well, and that puts you in control. I mean, really like, you know, I never thought of it like that, honestly, until you said that. I never no, thought that's, about yeah, that. No, that's, that's very unique. As opposed to taking the best deal that comes your way. Go out and make the best deal. Make it. There There's no, I mean, you, you've got what it takes, go make it. There's yeah. plenty of people out there that, you know, all three of us, everybody who's listening to this thing could go find people that's the next level up on whatever yes. that success ladder looks like. It could be an income thing, or it could be an assets gathered thing, but it could be a, a lifestyle balance thing, or it could be a succession plan thing. There are people that always are where we want to go. So let's go get them. There's yes. nothing inside of us, you know, uh, that we can't, that we don't already have to go make that happen. I just need to know a few tricks of the trade or a few tactics on how they got there. That's it. I mean, that's how, uh, that's, that's how Russell Brunson got started in, in, in what he's doing. He spoke at 10 X two and he was like, you know, if you want to sell vegetable oil online, you know, or whatever. Right. I think he was talking about, he talks about something else, you know, in, in his, in his little keynote speech, he's like, dude, go find someone that's doing it, study them, even buy their product, you know, so you know all the details and then mimic the model that's working, you know, and you've literally said a lot of the exact same stuff. And, and we've done it here. You know, we hired a YouTube coach. We've hired, I've hired business coaches. You know, I, I pay to go to events and masterminds and stuff because I, like you and a lot of other agents, I, you know, I, I want to learn and, and, and it, it always pays off. You always, I always get a return when I do stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, and, and I feel also feel like too, if you, if you, if you're around the right people, wisdom just like falls off these people and you can just like, I'll be like some people I respect that have been doing it for a while. I'll just be like listening and like, they're just casually like talking about how they hire somebody. And I'm like, 
you know, totally changes the way I approach recruiting or, you know, or something, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So they're like, pause, can I buy you one more drink and you can <laughs> exactly. slow down and say that again? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So what, what sort of, um, you know, what, what, okay. So you, you, I, I guess I take it, you found that individual mimic them. And so walk me through sort of, okay, your first five years in the business, then what? I mean, how, cause you obviously didn't start doing, how, I find that I can hit a certain level and then maybe kind of hit a glass ceiling. Um, how did you kind of get past that initial success? Okay, six figure earner plus plus then to become the whole whole on the on the next level because that's a different mindset. Sure, I, I would agree. Um, it goes. I'm a I'm a pretty organizational driven person. I'm a fairly detailed person. I can think through org charts and job descriptions and mm -hmm. um, job responsibilities fairly clearly. It's just a strength of mine. I've always had and. Uh, it was building into a team. So I was a solo entrepreneur for our first four years here, doing okay. everything for everybody. Okay. Wow. And um, it's while our company was getting off the ground and it's while we were trying to find our way. And that entire time, then it became, how do I get my first person in here with me? The very first person, because I can only put so many hours in, right? We've all been there. Yeah. Only so many hours I can put in, only so much work that I can do. So. What does that look like when that person comes in? And most of the time it's pretty sloppy, right? When that first person comes in, it's not gonna be clean. You can't expect it to be clean, right? But we, if we can have open communication and we can have respect of the person we brought in, we'll figure this out. Yeah. And so I'll hire for the, the person, I'll hire for somebody that I can trust and I, I'll hire for somebody that's got a strong work ethic. Uh, the job description itself like the skills, the proficient skills, I'm not ov overly worried about. If I can trust them, if I know they're gonna work hard, they're the right person, let's bring them in, we'll figure this out. And from there, then it was taking whatever my lowest revenue generating activities were and getting them onto another plate, yeah, right? Yeah. To free up, you know, to free up whatever those higher producing activities are. And then uh, literally doing that for the first uh, three people that I hired onto my team. So here inside the office, I've got, we've got a huddle of 10. So I've got nine that I'm, I'm blessed to lead every day. And, um, that's how the first three or four were hired. It continued to be mm -hmm. what skill sets can we bring into the team and where can we all continue to ratchet up our, our highest revenue producing activities, but it's going to be sloppy. I mean, you don't know what you're doing. So as long as you can trust the people and have communication, you, you you'll figure it out. So what was yep. the, what was the first job description you hired? Was it like an assistant office assistant or what? Yeah, our, our term inside here is a relationship manager. So what it was is uh, everything reactive. So it was mm. phone calls, emails, uh, anything that was coming in that needed an immediate response from us, our clients are the financial advisors. So it's when the financial advisors need something, right? Or there was a company that, that uh, issued a policy wrong or screwed up a commission or they needed an illustration or whatever it is. That, and, and those things would always take a lot of time or I would hang up a telephone call and there was a lot of follow-up items that needed to happen after that, the action item list, right? So it's all the reactive stuff. So really then I could stay um, like probably a lot of people here as as face-to-face, -face, as close to our clients as possible, whether that's in person or over the phone or whatever that looks like, just as much FaceTime as I can get is where typically most people in this industry make their highest income. So how can I stay as face to face as most often? And then the first, the first hire though, to answer you directly landed was uh, reactive services. Mm, so getting right. in as, and I, I actually believe that was his first two hires. So it was all, all the reactive stuff, trying to get it off as much as possible. Right on, right on. That's, That's awesome. Awesome. Um, do you um, mind... The other part about that is there are some people, sorry, real quick. There are some people that love that stuff. That's what I found. And again, I'm still relatively young, but now I was really, uh, I mean, I was 27, 28 years old at that time. Yeah. And the thought had never occurred to me in my ignorant world back then that some people actually like doing that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, they would come in and they would be smiling ear to ear and there would be, as we're figuring this out, there would be some times that they would be on the phone in a sales situation, almost in tears. You know what I mean? And I'm sitting here thinking like, what? Like so you can't hear. have that conversation with somebody, but you'll go and run these Excel spreadsheets for the next half hour. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where I want to pull my hair out, but <laughs> We're all wired different, so we can find those people. Then everybody's happy. We're all smiling. That's no, exactly that's good, right. Man. That's good. Um, do you mind? Can I ask you another question? I'm like yeah, eating yeah, this yeah. up, man. Um, I'm I'm learning more. I don't care if we even release this. I've got yeah. a ton of value already. Um, so okay, so talk me a little bit about what you know about marketing. You you can't do a billion dollars in sales in one month without getting into marketing. I'd love to for you to unpack a little bit about your guys's 
as much as you can. That's not proprietary. Just stay as high level as you want. Uh, what's your marketing, like not specifically media spin, but, but how do you approach, what's your marketing sort of mantra, if you will? Sure. So uh, I feel like I need to preface this and then answer it to try to give you, you and your listeners as much value as possible because our marketing mantra, our firm, if you think of it as us as a large consulting agency, um, our marketing approach to go find our clients who are the financial advisors is different, right? So, you know, some of that is digital. A lot of that is referral. About half of our business or half of our new clients now come by way of referral, wow. which I think is a byproduct of client experience. Yep. Mm. Um, and retention rate is very high. So if you've got more coming in the front door and very leaving, very few leaving out the back door, you're typically going to have good success. But I don't know if that model would probably or that answer would give you the most value because the success that that billion dollars that month um, and for the and, and for the year, it's seven or eight billion a year that we're seeing in just the annuity vertical that's coming into our office. Um, that is a byproduct of the financial advisors out there doing marketing into their marketplace. Right. That's a little bit more probably of most of the people that you're listening to. And what I would say is there is pretty much every piece of marketing that these financial advisors are doing in their local communities around the United States um, has branding as a secondary piece to it. Right. We're not looking to brand. We're yeah. not looking to throw. I don't know how much money I had a, had a conversation uh, today before I got on this podcast with you with somebody, somebody out of Denver. They're being positioned by somebody to go do a bunch of YouTube clips and then to get them promoted uh, through Facebook. And there's nothing wrong with the strategy sure. if that's right for your business. But for most people, there's no way this financial advisor I was visiting with should go drop three thousand dollars or four thousand dollars a month to brand on YouTube. Yeah. Come yeah. on. Yeah. I mean, so what we need is we need direct call to action. Yeah. Yeah. We we need uh, direct response marketing. Yeah. yeah. So I need yeah. to send out a mail piece with an enticing enough offer to get them to respond, either for what it is that I'm offering or to show up at an event, right? But I need direct response. Same thing. If I'm going to do Facebook ads, yeah. I need direct response into something, right? If I'm going to do radio shows, radio commercials, television, college courses, whatever it is that you want to do to get in front of that audience, I need direct response. Yep. yep. Right. Yep. And then I guess the, the other piece that immediately pops to my mind in that answer, Landon, is direct response. But then the second thing is not just one thing. Yeah, so again, when we mix. first start, like you're crowd, if I'm getting off the ground and I'm going to go find somebody to emulate and learn with, we probably learn one model. Yeah. We probably learn one way that's our most effective way, but we start to see an evolution of people that go from salespeople into business owners when we start to run a marketing plan, which is multi-funneled. Now I've got two ways and three ways and four ways that I'm strategically driving people into my office. Yeah, exactly. I'm exactly. We're, we're yeah. a digital marketing agency, but I would never tell somebody that they should only do digital marketing. Like it's called a marketing mix for a reason. Direct mail works, TV works in its own way if you want to drive phone calls in. Uh, digital marketing funnel works as well, but it's not all. It's not one secret sauce is the magic lead that's going to be able to lay down leads. It's a lot of different things, you know. I can't, I can't uh, agree with you more, man. And, and to hear that from a guy um, that's already been there, done that, is is really encouraging. So thanks for unpacking that a little bit. Yeah, it is. What's the what? What do you think is the biggest difference between the million dollar annuity producer? and the $10 million annuity producer? Consistent appointments. Getting in front of enough people. There's a, there's a quote that's shared inside of our office by one of the very, very top financial gathering firms in the country, somebody we work with out of Utah that gathers a couple hundred million dollars a year. It's pretty insane. Wow. And um, they say almost all business concerns can be solved with more first appointments. Mm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I need to put it's that like, wall. how am I, how am I going to be That's able to good. score on the court if I'm not putting up any shots? You know what I mean? I mean, that, that's great that, you know, you and I, I don't know that, that you're great on defense. It's great that you know when to call a zone or man to man. We're not putting up any shots. We can't score any points. Yeah. We're not winning this game. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yes. they got, they have to consistently get in front of people which goes back to that stage one, finding somebody to emulate, stage two, getting a second and a third funnel. Especially this, this could be uh, valuable to your crowd. There's a lot of times when I'll visit with somebody that's joining our firm, hiring us as consultants, and they have found one way to consistently get in front of people, Yeah. right? It could be 
direct mail to have somebody attend a, a dinner event, or it could be digital where they're responding to get on a webinar right now, right? Or it could be college courses where they're teaching somebody kind of through the adult continuing ed syllabus. We could go through some of those, but they have maybe one turnkey way that month by month they're getting people in and they know they need to get into a secondary way. And nearly every single time what we're going to coach into them is how to get into uh, if, and how to get into client events is where I'm going with this because mm. I'm going to ask them, are there any other ways that you're consistently getting in front of people? And the answer that they're going to give me is yeah, referrals. So it's fantastic. Uh, Cody and Landon, I'm sure you get referrals um, because you take care of your people, right? You take care of your people. They like you. Of course, they're going to refer a few people into you, but tell me, what are you doing strategically to generate those referrals? Mm. Yeah, what's your activity? Uh, I don't know, right? <laughs> uh, we still take care of people. We get some. So even just a multi, a multi marketing pronged approach could be as simple as that first way that you find, plus strategically finding ways to educate your clients and ask your clients for referrals. There are plenty of people, Cody, that we work with that gather ten million dollars a year of clients' money into annuities on top of the other stuff, with doing one marketing funnel very, very well. And then having some strategic client events where they're educating and cross-selling, right? Medicare yeah. into financial planning, financial planning into Medicare or into health or into long-term care, or into whatever it might be, strategic education and cross-sell and referral. Your mm. guest is your ticket, right? Setting up some events to where people can, uh, can have that going. We have 10, 12, $15 million a year producers that just do those two things if they're doing it well, but they gotta be in front of people. Yeah. Right on. I love, 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 love that, you, that you said that because that's, it's so simple. I mean, you could apply that to anything in the insurance industry, just consistent no activity, consistent appointments every week, no matter what you're selling, you, you could apply that to freaking real estate. You know I mean? You're going to have more success. Well, that's and, why they and want guys, business that, and not sales. Yeah. Sales. I don't, I don't yeah. want this to sound like uh, somebody would, would hear this and think, I don't have the marketing budget to do that. Or I don't think a lot of what we're doing right now, we're in a, we're still in a very different time with COVID. Right. And mm -hmm. plenty of the marketing that's happening right now is us coaching into people of how to go back into their database and reapproach all those people. Yeah. They were warmed up somewhere down the road. You know what I mean? So can we, can we get rid of some call reluctance, pick up the phone with a basic script, reach out to them and ask them how they're doing as human beings, ask them uh, a shared message of we're all in this together. Here's one thing that I wanted to offer to you that our firm is doing now is that something that you'd be interested in, mm -hmm. right? And there are firms all across the country that have, you know, file cabinets or databases full of prospects of people that they've met over the, the past few years. Let's go talk to them. It's human beings talking to human beings in an experience like this. And That's let's it. get the, the marketing machine going. We just need to be in front of people. It's just activity, 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 activity. It's block and tackle. I always tell people like, I, I'm a marketing guy, not an insurance agent. Cody's the insurance guy. And uh, you know, I always tell people the same thing. I'm like, dude, it's block and tackle. Just work the leads, get in touch with the leads. Like how many times have you called the leads? Like, and then wouldn't you know, like they pick it up and here they are talking to twice the people and all of a sudden they're getting more activity and more referrals and it all sort of leads one thing to the next. So Absolutely. Dude, what do you, and, and, and again, it doesn't guy? have to be anything. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Again, we're human beings talking to human beings. So pick up the telephone and ask them how they're doing. Give them something that's valuable. So you're not wasting their time. Five minutes into the call, ask them if they're open to receiving it. If not, on to the next one, right? We're still it. connected with somebody and ask them how their day was. Yeah, yeah, You know, yeah. so I, again, I might be a little bit biased because we've been over the phone for 15, 17 years. I don't feel like it's all that difficult, but uh, activity is activity. Let's get out there and get in front of them. Yes, so, so, some will, some won't. So what, who's next, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Heard it over the years for yes. sure. Uh, what's, uh, what's, some, what's some parting words of wisdom that you can leave with uh, our audience that uh, maybe something you haven't said yet, maybe something that, that you know, you're like, well, maybe this could be helpful to this individual. Um, what's, what's some final thoughts? And this has been unbelievable, by the way. This has been really good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Landon. Um, here's what I'm talking to a lot of people about right now. And it's a message that's going across our, our audience. And this is something that I feel is, a, is an evolution out of COVID, but something that is going to stick long-term inside the financial services industry. I'm calling it uh, mid-tail marketing. But what I, when I think of mid-tail marketing, here's in the past how a lot of of marketing inside of financial services, at least a fair number of the offices that we work with go. So you do some sort of a marketing campaign, right? Something with you guys on in the digital space. 
or something mail or radio, whatever it might be, but we're going to do a campaign and we're going to get people that respond. And then of those people who respond, some are going to continue to engage. Then some are going to meet with you and then some are going to end up becoming clients and they're going to fall off, but you're always going to have this, this uh, deteriorating number, but we're still trying to hold on to as many of those percentages as we can to have a good closing percentage and turn a, a good ROI. That's the short tail of marketing. Yeah. That's the very first part of the graph. And we're always going to be trying to improve those numbers. And if we're being honest, what a lot of people do if they're out there spending money is they go through those percentages, they make that stuff happen. And then the people that don't become clients, 50 people responded to your campaign and three people became clients. Yes. They take the other 47, they put them on the other end of the tail, the long tail, which is my email that hits them once a week. Or uh, I try to get them with me on my Facebook page or I send them a newsletter, whatever it might be. So we have this immediate ROI short term. We have this long tail, which is great. Let's build our list. Let's get out mm -hmm. to stay in front of them all the time. But there's got to be something, the evolution that's happened here during COVID, there's got to be a mid tail in between that short ROI and that long term drip. And it's more about what's happening inside of offices days one through 14. Right? If if we go out, if anybody who's, who's uh, listening to this goes out and they opt into any of the big financial firms, uh, without mentioning them here, but we all know who they are, the billion dollar firms, the one that you see, the ones you see on national TV, and you go onto their website right now and you ask for something free from them, this free report or that free white paper, they are not going to just send it to you and then say, hey, if you want something more, call us and then put you on an email drip. No, <laughs> you're getting a call from them day one, day two, day five, day seven, day 10, you're on, you're heavy inside of their texting campaign, their email campaign. They're hot and heavy for the next two weeks, especially if you put in there that you're worth some money. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's the exact same thing in our world. We want ROI immediately. We want to convert. We want long, we want short term. We want, we want the long tail too. We want to build the list. But a lot of the evolution that we're seeing right now out of COVID is what is happening days one through 14, because there's a lot of people right now that are concerned, that do have a, a real need in this financial space, and that do want some answers, but life's a little bit crazy, and we got to make sure that we stay in front of them. So I would just say maybe thinking about, um, about your approach in the prospects in the very immediate and the mid and the long term, and what sort of tactics and strategies you can put around all of those. That's awesome. That's good. That's awesome. Yeah, we automate that for our clients. So we drop all of our um, leads into a, a CRM that then fosters that lead gen, text, email for those 14 days. They also get the raw data as well to then make sure that you know they go from lead to hot lead to appointment booked. So all of those that haven't moved to hot lead, there's also need to be phone calls made, et cetera. But there's those automations that are going and they end up in the email drip as well. Landon, so. it's beautiful if you can automate that and get it out of your world even better. But let me just add one thing icing on top of that cake. Some of the most successful financial advisors that I work with right now are taking staff that they have inside their office, or I'm sure you could outsource this, but they are taking people that are doing nothing but phone calls in that exact same situation. So if you could layer on top of your drip and your automation, what you have of hitting those people with three or four or five phone calls over those first two weeks, yeah. I would, uh, I would politely suggest to you that we could get a much higher conversion on yeah. it too, as yeah, opposed yeah, to asking them to respond to the email. So as much contact as we can have in those first couple of weeks. 100%. Yes. Yes, man. Maddie knew. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's the personal brand. And, and they can follow you on Instagram at Maddie knew. N E U N E U. Yep. M A T T Y N E U. You can find it on Twitter. You can find it on Instagram. That's the uh, that's the website domain too, MattyNew.com. So we'd love, love to have it, people man. check it out, and we'd be happy to uh, to answer any questions or provide any insight off of this that people might have. Cool. This is good man. Yeah. Thank you so much. There's a lot of big time players that need to hear this message today. This is strong. So thank you. So appreciate you, man. Thanks for joining us. For sure. All right. Thank you, guys. Boom. Hey, if you love this podcast, which obviously you did because it's got my buddy Landon and I. Hey, we got a video right here for you. It's how to hire and recruit insurance agents with the wolf. All right, click on there and we'll see you over there. You got to realize that the typical interview questions out there are like they're all well known and most people.